Welcome to The Quantum State, a podcast exploring the latest research and innovation in quantum computing. Join us as we dive into groundbreaking breakthroughs, trends, and news shaping the quantum landscape. Discover the cutting edge developments pushing the boundaries of computing technology. Through insightful discussions, expert interviews, and in-depth analysis, we unravel the intricate theories and real-world applications driving this transformative field. The Quantum State also offers updates from BTQ, sharing the company's research progress and innovative products at the forefront of quantum computing. So embark on this mind-bending journey with us as we navigate the realm of quantum computing, witnessing its potential to revolutionize our world. Hi, everyone. Welcome to The Quantum State, presented by BTQ. I'm Anastasia Marchenkova, and I've been part of the quantum industry for about 15 years now, ranging from quantum telecommunication to ion traps to superconducting qubits and software. And today with us, we have Gavin Brennan, who's a professor at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia, chief investigator in the ARC Center for Excellence in Engineered Quantum Systems and a quantum information advisor for the quantum company BTQ, that's headquartered in Vancouver. We also have Peter Rohde, a senior lecturer at University of Technology, Sydney, Australia at the Center for Quantum Software and Information, a former ARC Future Fellow and the author of The Quantum Internet published by Cambridge University Press. Today, we'll be talking about the proof of work consensus by quantum sampling paper by BTQ, which was published in June, 2023. Bitcoin and quantum is a super hot topic. People ask me a ton about it all the time. When will quantum break Bitcoin? And there's a lot of very interesting ways that potentially quantum computing can affect can affect Bitcoin and other crypto cryptocurrencies. But first, I have one question to set the stage is, can you go through a quick background of how the blockchain flow works and the pieces, the steps of the transaction verification, block reaction proof of work, the consensus mechanism and the block confirmation? Sure. Uh so, um, yeah, the, the general idea is you're in the middle of this chain, which has a, a it's basically a ledger of uh, a bunch of previous transactions that have been performed on the network. And it, you're at some stage where you want to add a new bundle of transactions. So uh, transactions are sent to the network by a bunch of nodes that want to participate. And actually before they can get included, uh, they have to be validated by the nodes um, to make sure they're legitimate. And there's a pretty standard communication protocol for this. Um, and also you wanna check that the sender has sufficient funds in order to complete a transaction. Um, and at that point, um, a block is created. And um, this is just a, a group of transactions. And um, this block will contain a header which includes the previous block's hash, a timestamp, and something called a nonce. Now, the previous block's hash is there to ensure that there's actually a really a chain happening here. So the, the current bundle of transactions also includes information about the previous block, and that previous block contained information about the two blocks before. And so this is there to make the chain immutable so that you can't um, alter a, a transaction some you know, time back in history without affecting new transactions and new block informations. Um, and this thing called a nonce uh, that shows up in the current block is just gonna be a random number. And what happens is uh, in order to add on this new block onto the blockchain, uh, the miners, that is the nodes of the network, have to compete to solve some mathematical puzzle. And this is called a proof of work puzzle or just simply proof of work. And what's done in a standard proof of work, like what's done by Bitcoin, is uh, it's uh, put as a puzzle for the miners to find a bit string, that is a nonce, which when uh, hashed uh, produces some outcome, which is less than some number. 
So you can think of this as just something which will, um, when you include the nonce and the, uh, the block header information and you hash that, you should get a number with some number of leading zeros. Uh, the hash function is what's known as a high entropy function. So if you change even one bit, you get a completely different output. And so there's really no structure to this kind of puzzle. Uh, the best thing you can do is keep trying out a nonce, go through the machinations of doing a hash, and see if you get a small enough number that comes out. And you do this over and over and over until one of the miners succeeds in, in finding a nonce that satisfies that condition. And then um, if uh, that they do, then they broadcast that to the network. And the other nodes can quickly verify the solution. So it's, it's just a very fast calculation to check that the proposed solution was a correct one. And then if, if they are correct, then that miner is rewarded with newly minted cryptocurrency and the block is added to the blockchain. So that's, that's the uh, kind of standard uh, proof of work procedure. And, uh, you know, it does, it has some very nice features. Uh, one thing, you know, this is all digital. So whether it's cryptocurrencies or other activities in blockchain, you, you want to have some way to verify that, you know, people have put in the computational effort in order to add this block. If there was no effort involved that anyone could do anything instantaneously and it would be very easy to to cheat um, or you know just, just make up transactions that um, didn't cost you anything even if maybe you were didn't have the funds to complete them so um, it's a uh, it's a very robust mechanism that's uh, worked very well for a lot of different applications and um, and that's that's just sort of a general overview of how it works that's great. You mentioned that Bitcoin is one of the ones that uses proof of work. Which coins are using proof of work now? Because proof of stake is becoming more common. Ethereum has moved to proof of stake. So what's the distribution there? What are other popular popular coins that are doing proof of work versus stake? Yeah. So, uh, well, there's uh, Elon Musk's coin, Dogecoin. <laughs> there's Litecoin, uh, Monero, um, Zcash. Uh, Dash, Zcash and Monero are kind of famous for being uh, privacy coins that are very hard to trace. Um, but uh, there's quite a few here. Um, maybe the one of the most famous ones that you is Ethereum, uh, which uh, moved over to proof of stake, I believe it was last year. And that's the number two coin. But a lot of the, the coins that are high up there in the, the um, coin market cap are you still using proof of work. So why is proof of work losing popularity? Like you mentioned, I mean, Bitcoin was the first coin out there. A lot of people started their own chains. They're all proof of work, but now we're seeing that transition. The, the main reason for the transition is uh, hidden in the name itself. Proof of work, uh, well, work involves wasting resources by definition of some form or another. And uh in the case of computational resources, that equates to energy or in investment of money into buying CPUs or, or customized chips for doing this process. And one of the aspects of proof of work, at least say in Bitcoin, for example, is that the difficulty of solving the problem is, is adjusted over time um, for, for monetary reasons. But that means it gets harder and harder over time. And so does the energy consumption associated with maintaining the network. And these headlines that you read about how Bitcoin is using the same energy as a small size country, well, that's true. And that's a very genuine criticism that, that that's a lot of wasted resources, but it's necessary under that kind of protocol. And the proof of stake you mentioned is really a, a way of addressing that particular problem. Can we do things in a more efficient way? Yeah, and if I can just add that um, proof of work was actually invented in the early 90s as a way to fight spam. So the idea was, you know, at that time, people were worried about spam. They had no idea what it's like now. But uh, at that time, the idea was, well, you disincentivize people from sending out mass emails, make them pay for it. 
And the way you make them pay for it without having some complicated transaction system is to make them do some computational work before they can send an email out. So just be a little bit of work, which would not be a big deal if you're just sending email to a few friends and so forth. But if you're sending it to tens of thousands of people, it really becomes something that's sufficiently costly. It's really interesting. Is that still used today? I think it, uh, I think it was tried out um, and it, it was working, but uh, yeah, I, I don't think it was actually maintained. I'm not sure if there are any servers that still use it. Now, I guess there's not necessarily so much reason to use it today because, you know, filtering techniques are pretty good and they're pretty reliable. I don't even check my junk email anymore because it's so good at detecting what's what. I Unless like... it's for some strange conference in Kazakhstan, <laughs> which we get as academics. I've gotten that a couple of times too. And recently I've been actually getting more spam. So I think the, the filters are starting to get not as good with these chat GPTs and all the AI tools mm. coming out, right? They're, they're like, oh, a robot wrote this, but it's your friend, you know, using some sort of tool to send you an email. So that's going to be an interesting transition in the spam filters. All right. So we've talked a little bit about the proof of work. So your paper is called Proof of Work Consensus by Quantum Sampling. And I think this is really interesting because I have been seeing, you know, over time, I've, I've been involved in crypto for a little bit, seeing the transition to proof of stake, but that takes so many resources. We've seen, I mean, the Ethereum updates, it's taken way longer than we thought it would. It's a huge undertaking to do, but you guys are, pre are presenting something called proof of work consensus by quantum sampling. So first let's talk about what is boson sampling? So boson sampling is uh, what they call a, a NISC or uh, noisy intermediate scale quantum uh, architecture. So it's one of the ones that is available today that has limited utility, solves a very limited class of problems, uh, but it does something nonetheless which classical computers can't do. Um, and so that's the primary interest for them. Uh, boson sampling is an example of, a, of an optical type of NISC problem. There are other ones in other architectures as well. But basically, the problem is that you put a whole bunch of single photons through a large interferometer, which is just a beam splitter network, and you measure the photon distribution at the output, and it follows some statistical distribution. But the issue is that the sample space, as in the number of possible distinct configurations of how you can measure the photons, is absolutely astronomical because of the combinatorics of where photons can appear of amongst a whole bunch of outputs that grows exponentially with the number of photons. So this is a, a difficult problem for classical computers to solve efficiently. Um, but it's a very different type of problem than the ones that we're really familiar with. Most of the problems that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis are what we call decision problems, where you ask a question and it gives you an answer. Um, this is a, a different class of problem called a sampling problem, where you're not getting an answer to a question. What you're doing is getting samples from a big statistical distribution. And that in itself limits its applicability because it doesn't directly map to the sorts of problems that we're usually interested in asking. Nonetheless, it's a, it's a hard problem and one that didn't find much application until now. But we were interested in saying, well, is there a way of applying this in a, in a blockchain kind of context is, is proof of work. And that's uh, what we've uh, been pursuing with that. Yeah, so let's maybe take a step back and first uh, cover what actually is a boson compared to a fermion and then talk about, so the beam splitter, what's this actually hmm. split? Because you send a photon through a beam splitter, it splits based on the polarization. How does that work with bosons, fermions? And yeah. what's it actually doing? Right, so, so uh, going, one step back even further, let's think about the classical case of, of a sampling problem. Uh, lots of us will have seen what they call the Galton board back in high school, where you have this pin board where balls drop in the top and you have pins and at each pin, the ball has 50-50 chance of going each way. And then they accumulate in buckets at the bottom and they just follow this binomial distribution, a Gaussian-like curve. Um, so that's an example of a sampling problem. Uh, any individual sample doesn't answer a question, 
but collectively many samples gives you information about the distribution. Um, so that's a classical one and it's easy to simulate. Like obviously you can just plug in uh, a binomial distribution into any calculator and it'll give you answers. Um, so, so a quantum one uh, that we're looking at, uh, instead of pins where the ball drops 50-50 going each way, it uses beam splitters where when a photon, uh, which is a boson, as you mentioned, I'll explain that in a second, it hits a beam splitter, but instead of going each way with 50-50 probability, it goes into a superposition of going each way with some according to the reflectivity of the beam splitter. So it's analogous to the, to the pin board, except that instead of doing things probabilistically, it does it in superposition. Uh, now, bosons and fermions that you mentioned, they, they uh, undergo different types of statistical behavior in that kind of experiment. Fermions uh, have different relations in how they statistically relate to one another. You can't have multiple fermions in the same, uh, in the same uh, what they call an optical mode or the same location effectively. Uh, whereas bosons, you can, you can have multiple ones in the same place. Um, now, if you do that experiment that we described with fermions, uh, where <clears throat> they don't have the ability to have multiple ones in the same place, that's actually, despite being quantum, it's still classically easy to simulate what's going on with that statistical distribution. Uh, it's a specific property of bosons that when you do it uh, like this, that that probability distribution at the output is one that you can't classically um, evaluate in an efficient way. And that's why we specifically focus on bosons here rather than fermions. Great. Okay. So now we've talked a little bit about the boson problem. So when the boson sampling problem has been around for a bit, but um, can you explain the, quant uh, the concept of quantum supremacy and boson sampling was originally proposed to demonstrate it. So how does this relate? Yeah, so, so quantum supremacy is a pretty loosely defined term. It, it doesn't have a very objective standard definition. It, it's really a, a hand wavy one, which means can we do something with, with a quantum architecture that by a significant margin exceeds what classical computers can do today? Um, and full-scale quantum computers obviously have the promise of doing that, but they're quite far off and, and we're not close really to having that yet. Uh, and that's where the whole interest in these NISC era devices came, including boson sampling, which was, even though we don't have the technological capabilities to build full-scale quantum computers, are we still able to do something at least that a classical computer can't do? And all of these different NISC problems, they're all very specialized problems. In fact, very contrived ones that are designed not for the purpose of solving a problem of interest. They're designed for the purpose of demonstrating in principle that you can do something that a classical computer can't do. And that's where all the, the interest in boson sampling really started. And there was a big rush uh, for different players to, to try and demonstrate it. Uh, it seems that uh, we are in the, 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 the post-classical era for these types of problems. There's good reason to believe that classical computers can't do boson sampling problems at the scale that we've experimentally demonstrated now. Um, although it hasn't been proven, there are various conjectures that that relies upon. Um, but, uh, but, but, but that's really the context. It, it, it's not a useful problem. It's just, can we do something is way better than what a classical computer can do. Yeah, and I'll I'll just I'll just add there that um, there's other kinds of sampling problems also. You can um, do quantum sampling with uh, qubits, which aren't really um, <clears throat> necessarily bosons. They, a qubit can be encoded in a fermion, mm -hmm. or it could be that you know different qubits are uh, you know distinguishable, and so they don't have the same kind of property as, as bosons or fermions on their own. But, um, you know, there was the famous experiments done by Google. I think it was in, was it 2018? The, uh, 2018. Um, yeah. yeah, the sampling experiments, which claimed to demonstrate quantum supremacy. And there it was, again, kind of a 
well, truly a useless problem <laughs> where you just, you, you know, you take every qubit, rotate it from a zero to a zero plus one, and then apply a bunch of phase gates and uh, controlled phase gates, ones that couple spins together and, and add in phases if, you, if the control was a one and, uh, and then measure in the zero one basis. And um, there are some pretty well formulated conjectures that that kind of process is hard to simulate with a classical computer. Um, nonetheless, it was shown um, not too long after that paper came out by, uh, I think it was Alibaba, that uh, they were able to simulate a lot of that statistics uh, using um, uh, contraction methods in a computer simulation on a classical computer. Although it's true that, that that process wouldn't scale well for classical computers as you increase the size. But um, yeah, originally when we were looking at this problem, we were considering whether we could do it with qubits. Um, the thought being that it might be something that you could you know, even test out on one of the IBM or uh, Rigetti or other devices available on the cloud. Uh, but uh, after we went through it, we actually found that using the, the boson sampling method is more direct and probably more mature technologically. What do you mean about more direct or more mature? The hardware is there or the, the yeah. more known? The hardware is there. It's just, you know, there's been, people have been working in the field of quantum optics for decades now on, um, you know, getting down to the point where they can generate single photons and, and, and actually integrating them into waveguides which uh, now for well over a decade now, they've been able to perform um, in, you know, little interferometers between a pair of waveguides. And then using silicon uh, fabrication techniques, they are able to build an array of these waveguides where you have channels for all the photons to move through. And so this technology really, I would say is more mature than the um, quantum computing technology using qubits right now. That makes sense. When I first got into quantum 15 years ago, I was in a quantum optics lab and we had a few paper deterministic single photons. So it's been around for a while. Nobody cared about quantum computing back then. You know, we couldn't do anything with qubits at all. But it's interesting you right. mentioned on the quantum supremacy side, right? I mean, even this week we had papers coming out and people were arguing about, well, it's compared to this method. Yes, it's better. But compared to this other method, is it actually better? And what does better actually mean in quantum technology, right? If, you know, maybe it's not faster, but it uses way less resources or energy. Can that be considered better? Does it have to be speed for quantum supremacy? So I think that's a really good point to talk about here. So uh, going off on that, you guys talked a little bit about using qubits, but what motivated you to explore the application of boson sampling for the proof of work consensus? The, the main reason for considering uh, boson sampling is because the hardware is available now and quite a few people have demonstrated it, well, I mean, it wasn't the only candidate. There are, there are other examples of quantum processes that you could use uh, for proof of work. Uh, ones that would be sort of much more plug and play compatible with the existing model. The, the hash functions that Gavin referred to earlier, they're what we call one-way functions. They're just functions that are very easy to evaluate in one direction, but very hard to evaluate in the reverse direction. There are, there are quantum algorithms that, that solve those kinds of problems, which could be a direct substitute, but they're ones that really require large-scale large quantum computers. And we really wanted to see what we could do with what's available today uh, to, to try and fast track that, because we don't want to have to wait another 10 or 15 years for a large-scale quantum computer. And what what size are you talking here for the NISC era? So noisy intermediate scale devices, when we're talking about millions of qubits, that's definitely in the range of, you know, fully fault tolerant. What sizes are you looking at for this application? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a lot less because, um, I mean, one of, one of the biggest overheads with large scale quantum computers is all the error correction and fault tolerance that's required to make a large scale algorithm work so it doesn't lose all its coherence. Um, the, the NISC era devices, by definition, are ones that don't have error correction. So all those overheads don't exist, and you're just down to raw qubits, or in this case, photons. And uh, you don't actually need astronomical numbers of photons to really outperform a classical computer. 
just uh, on the order of dozens of photons is is enough because of the the combinatorics associated with, with how photons can be configured at the outputs in in all the different output uh, modes. Th those sorts of combinatorics uh, grow so rapidly that they very quickly surpass what a classical computer can do. So by the time you reach 30 photons or something of that order, you're already in a regime which is really, really difficult to evaluate classically. Yeah, I saw on uh, one of the websites talking about the resource estimation. It was something like 32 qubits take 32 gigabytes of RAM or 64, and then you double for every additional qubit on top of that. So it very quickly gets out of control. I don't think people realize how quickly it actually scales in those resources. Exactly, exactly. So when I, when I say on the order of 30 photons, uh, it's more, perhaps uh, order really means plus or minus one or two photons like that because of the way the scaling works. All right, so we've gone through kind of the background. It's, I know, quite a few definitions that we've gone through, but now can you take me through the scheme you proposed, the coarse grain boson sampling? Right, sure. sure. Oh, you want to go ahead, Peter? Either go way. for it, Gavin. Go for it, go for it. Uh, yeah, so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's similar in the sense that we're going to assume there's a blockchain and... Um, you know, let's just say that there's a bunch of miners that want to participate and there are some people that submit uh, transactions and, um, you know, you've, you've validated the people participating as transactors, uh, but you want then to validate the new block. So um, now what's going to happen is the first thing that's going to be different is instead of just going off to the races and trying to solve a proof of work puzzle, we ask all the miners to uh, submit some stake into the network. So if it's, you know, kind of um, cryptocurrency, then they could actually, um, you know, actually, uh, you know, send some tokens to the network, which will be tied up during this process of validating the block. Uh, if it's, you know, something else for blockchain, then it would be maybe some other token uh, that could have been purchased when you joined the network. Um, and then, uh, th so this is what this is going to do is put, you know, put some stake on the participants. And it's, it's really going to be there to enable us to penalize cheaters. Uh, and so I'll explain what that is in a minute. Um, at this point, uh, you will have a problem that Sorry, is announced really quickly, just penalize cheaters. So in the traditional blockchain protocol where there's kind of no way to cheat because of this one way function, is that what, what we're saying here? And here there might be a way and you're adding an extra layer of security. Is that right? Yeah. So the difference in this, the problem we're looking at, uh, because it's a sampling problem, it's not in this sort of decision model type that, that Peter talked about earlier, where it can be hard to, to, to solve, but easy to check. Here, it's, um, it's a sampling problem, which uh, we'll, we have a way to check uh, a property of a distribution, but we can't say, oh, everyone can immediately check uh, whether your samples provided are valid. Mm -hmm. So, um, so what we have to do is, is have a, a coarse grained check, which, um, if you fail, then you lose your stake basically. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's just something that, that's intrinsically different between these, um, decision model problems like trapdoor functions and a problem based on sampling. So yeah, so once uh, the the new block is is uh, bundled together, um, and the, the the miners stake some currency, then um, a problem is announced, and uh, like the problem similar to regular proof of work, will depend upon uh, the hash of the uh, previous block's information, as well as a timestamp and the current block's information. And um, 
from that hash, there will be a, uh, an, a permutation applied to the locations where your input photons go into the interferometer uh, of description of a boson sampling problem. So like, like Peter mentioned earlier, boson sampling is just, you have a bunch of ports where photons can travel. Maybe there's, you know, a hundred ports and let's say 10 of them have a single photon in each. And so what'll happen is the particular problem that's posed uh, for this block will tell you how you should reshuffle those input photons so that 10 of them go in different locations. And, um, and then also as part of the problem, you have a description of the interferometer. That is the, the little elementary gates that show up for each pair of uh, uh, waveguides that the photons travel through. And um, in, a, in a, probably an easier formulation, you would just assume that that's fixed for you know, an epic of, of uh, the consensus. Um, but you could also have it so that this, this unitary description of the interferometer changes depending upon the problem. Uh, and then, um, and the reason for having this, this input dependent upon the hash is so that you can't do pre-computation. So you couldn't like ahead of time, just try to do the sampling problem um, before you knew what the block was going to be. So it, it makes it a, uh, a problem you couldn't get any, any um, help with or any ad advanced progress on before the problem was posed. So yeah, all the miners then go off, they, they stick their photons into those, those right correct ports, they send them through the interferometer, they measure the outputs, and each time they perform a measurement, that produces a sample. So it'll say like, you know, a photon was detected in mode three, and then another one was detected in mode five, and maybe two were found in mode 17. And they just write down these numbers, and uh, then they um, continue this sampling for a certain amount of time, which will also be dependent upon uh, the problem. So like when the problem is announced, it will also be announced some time over which people will sample. And after this point, the miners will commit their samples to the network. So uh, what we mean by this is a, is a standard kind of bit commitment method used in uh, communications where you want to send information where you can't cheat and, and pretend like you had some different information after you sent it and it's been received, but also other people can't copy it right away. So um, basically you just, uh, it, it involves hashing your samples with some salt. The salt is there just a little extra information uh, so that people can't tell what the information is, but once you've sent it, it's committed, you can't change it. So um, the, the miners send a, a bundle of their samples. And then, um, then uh, once they <clears throat> reveal the salt they used, then the other users can actually see what those samples are. And it's again, that's a record of where the photons were measured. And uh, at this point, we have uh, a validation procedure which is there to check whether people were actually submitting honest samples. Because at this point you could just have someone with like a classical computer or just like a random number generator that spits out. Is there's a, a beacon which sends out some random string and to all the players on the network. And from this beacon, people have instructions or they can figure out how to coarse grain the samples. So basically what you do is maybe if you have a hundred modes where the photons can travel, you pick some random number of 10 of the modes and call that bin one. And then another random number of bins, uh, modes 11 through 20 and call that bin two, etc. And then you construct probability distributions on this coarse grain distribution. The reason for this is uh, the coarse grained distribution for the, the particular interferometer the photons are traveling through and also the random input that's 
dependent upon the block information, can actually be checked on the classical computer. You can't check it if, if you don't coarse grain it. It's just a problem that's too hard for classical computers to do. But once you coarse grain things with just a few big bins, it turns out you can. And so what can happen is uh, nodes can then check each other and they can say, oh, you know, it looks like the samples you gave are very far away from what your coarse grain distribution should be. So I'm gonna call you a cheater. And um, if, if you're honest, then you will be able to pass this validation test. Uh, so uh, at this point, we're able to filter out honest players from dishonest players. And then the, the second stage is to provide rewards. So in normal proof of work, you, you get a reward if you're the first one to find the nonce that uh, hashes to a small enough number. Um, but in this case, what we do is we provide rewards depending upon how close your submitted distribution is to a, uh, another coarse grain distribution called a, uh, a Fox state bin distribution. And um, again, the way you find this coarse grain distribution is from a, a, um, a beacon that is sent out that everyone can agree on. And it just says, okay, we're gonna group things not according to the places where photons were measured, but according to the different kinds of measurement records you could get. So you, you couple in a, like a whole big group of what measurement outcomes could be and you call that bin one and bin two and bin three, et cetera. And you look for the peak bin probability among this coarse grain distribution. And uh, a reward is given to you that's proportional to the number of samples you committed that it were also validated and uh, how close you are to the mean over the network. And so uh, then after these rewards are given out, uh, the new block is added to the blockchain. So there's, you know, there's an overall similarity to the regular proof of work in the sense it's a chain and you're adding a block and there are some rewards, um, but there are differences because of the sampling feature and uh, the fact that we do require some staking in order to penalize uh, dishonest miners. Yeah, I think that's really the an interesting component of this. And Bitcoin proof of work, I believe it's winner take all, which means potentially the bigger miners tend to do better in the end. It's very hard to succeed as a smaller miner. And this bidding strategy re rewards honest miners and distributes proportional. Um, are there any other classical chains that do this strategy and have you guys talked to folks in the crypto space? Space is something that miners want and are striving for. I mean, obviously, we've seen complaints from the smaller miners about this. Or does the winner make, take all make more sense? I think in in, in our context, it it's sort of mandatory uh, that it not be winner take all. Uh, the reason being that because we're not using uh, an efficiently verifiable hash function where one person can solve it and anyone else can just check that they did it honestly and correctly. We're not in that framework. When people submit all the samples they get from a boson sampler, there's no classical or quantum way to directly know whether they accurately come from an actual boson sampling device. Um, there's no efficient strategy for that. So instead, the way consensus works is by comparing the, the statistics of the bint distributions between independent players who have solved the same problem. Um, now, they're not directly comparing the samples themselves. They're comparing these binned distributions. So there's no direct comparison of actual measurement outcomes. There's nothing to lay down to, to check. Uh, it's necessary for it to be done in this communal kind of way. And that necessarily implies that the, the way you distribute the rewards has to be reconsidered, has to be on an equitable basis according to what all the players contribute, because there is no single winner. It's necessary to cross-check with one another. You you mentioned as well on the sampling approach, you, you talked about commit the samples to the network. They have a boson sampler. So 
let's dive a little bit into the hardware here. So you're assuming the miners here have that boson sampling hardware and there's a connection there as well, or is that a classical connection to commit the sample to the network? Oh, oh so that's, the a, that's a good Sorry. question. Yeah. Oh, that's just a good, good question. Yes, that all the communication is all classical. So um, otherwise, honestly, you know, I got to say, there are some protocols out there uh, that suggest using quantum communication for blockchain. And I just think that's that's going to be very far in the future before we have reliable quantum communication networks. And also they would be slow. Yeah, so with this sampling approach and so they're going to have to have this boson sampler hardware, but then it's pretty easy to send off the samples. That's not taking a lot of energy. So how does this approach address the issues of energy consumption? So I think sure. the, the, the main issue here is that because this is a, a problem where there is an exponential quantum enhancement, um, if you were to, you, you can in principle do this whole protocol with classical computers. It's just that the, the time taken would be astronomical because of the, the com complexity scaling. Uh, because we're solving it quantum mechanically, it inherently gets that huge efficiency improvement, meaning that proof of work doesn't have to be as energy consuming as if you were going to actually implement it using classical computers. And that's really wh wh where the energy advantage comes from. Yeah, just another thing too is, um, you know, when when proof of work the standard proof of work was devised it was realized not too long afterwards that you could find uh application specific integrated circuits to do the hashing so you didn't need a universal classical computer you could you could you know design these special purpose processors that their only task is to hash and they are incredibly fast I mean, you can buy like hint minor devices that do, you know, tera hashes, dozens of tera hashes per second, which is astounding. Um, but uh, they're also very energy consuming. So the the hash function is is something which uh, is susceptible to special purpose devices for computing. Um, on the, on the other hand, our problem using boson sampling, a, a boson sampler using photons is probably the fastest you could ever do. Even if we imagine a future where quantum computers are ubiquitous, uh, quantum computers are not going to be faster for boson sampling until you got to really, really large problem sizes, at which point when you include the overheads for error correction, it would take way too long to be useful for consensus anyway. So, you know, we're talking about devices that are already working at the speed of light and have, you know, very fast measurements with recovery. Um, so it's, it's sort of application specific proof as a problem. And so the, the energy cost, the dominant energy cost for the, the, the boson samplers is cooling the detectors. Um, you know, these are detectors that have to measure individual particles of light, individual photons. And so, um, uh, the, the most efficient ones are superconducting based detectors. And to those you have to keep, you know, below four Kelvin, um, which requires, you know, using cryogenic coolers. Uh, but for example, you know, you, the, the energy cost to run, uh, cooler that would work for detectors to be able to integrate into this kind of uh, boson sampler cost about one and a half kilowatts in power. Now that, that technology is improving. So uh, if anything, you could imagine the energy cost could go down as the technology of these quantum devices improves. But uh, it's very unlikely it would, would require it to go up. And also if you, if you have like more miners into the market, you will have to increase the difficulty of the problem just like they do in normal proof of work. But here, because of the scaling of the problem, that means just adding in a few more photons, which means that you wouldn't have to buy a whole new device. You could you know, probably just work with the one you have.
That was a really interesting point. I was thinking about, you were talking about the qubits and I've been on the superconducting side, right? Talking about the energy efficiency. It's like, yes, the computer itself, you know, may use a lot less energy to do this problem and may take a lot less time, but even just cooling the Creo systems and superconducting qubits can be 500K to a million dollars a year. So if you're looking at that for a boson sampler, which is not the case, you know, that that's just not possible for miners to have that technology sitting around and that energy costs would go up a lot. So that's really interesting. And you all mentioned you looked at this for different types of hardware. So can this be used for other quantum hardware? And I guess we talked a little bit already about how it affected costs, but do the costs increase or, or the runtimes increase because of, you know, photons are speed of light? Uh, so when you say can this be used on other sorts of hardware, do you mean can we adapt this to other NISC type of architectures? Yeah, uh, the, ion yeah, mm -hmm. yeah so, so that's still an open question, um, and it's one that we're very interested um, in exploring further. We don't know all the answers to it for other architectures completely. However, just in optics itself, there are actually multiple variants of boson sampling. Uh, the very initial one that was described and the one that we refer to in this research work uh, is what they call FOX state or photon number state boson sampling, where you're putting in single photons. There are other variations on boson sampling where you can use other sorts of light that are not single photons. They used uh, things called squeezed states, which are neither single photon, but they're not classical light either. They're also uniquely quantum. And similarly, when you put them through the same kind of random interferometer, it solves a hard problem also, uh, but the statistical distribution is a little different. It's described in slightly different mathematical terms. Uh, so that's one thing uh, where it seems quite likely uh, that we'll, it will be directly applicable. Uh, to other architectures altogether, that's a bit more nuanced because there are lots of details associated with uh, going from a sampling problem to a binned sampling problem. And that stage is really crucial for what we're doing. If you consider just a sampling problem on an arbitrary quantum device, the sample space is exponentially large. The number of possible configurations of what you can measure is, is exponentially large. And, and what that means is that no matter how many samples you take, you're not going to converge on the actual prob underlying probability distribution. You can't take as many samples as is necessary to do that. So you have to divide it into buckets the way we've done it with this binning. Now, we've done that calculation in the optics case, and we know that that works. Whether completely different physical platforms are going to be amenable to similar types of characteristics when you start binning the statistics that requires completely new calculations, unfortunately, and it's not immediately obvious whether things will carry across. But it does appear that they will carry across to other variations of boson sampling. Interesting. So correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think this paper has been fully tested yet on the hardware. Is that correct? Or yeah, it's all simulation based at this stage. Uh, Get, get, getting access to quantum hardware is harder than it sounds, despite <laughs> right. all you read about the different cloud providers having it's different right. services available. It's not easy to get hold of these things. Um, so that is something that we're trying to do, because we do want to know how it will work in practice rather than just in theory. But is that yeah. actually there today to do, if you could get your hands on on one, does someone have, have a system that you're... Oh, for sure. Them? <laughs> For sure. So, so uh, up until recently, the Canadian company Xanadu, um, that specializes in continuous variable uh, optical quantum computing, they had a large scale boson sampler called Borealis available as a cloud service online. You could just go into a web page, upload a script, uh, ask what you want, and it sends you back the results. Um, and that was... Um, a commercial demonstration of a boson sampling architecture which uh, is believed to be very much post-classical as in it had a sufficient number of sources and ports that it was in a regime where classical computers well and truly wouldn't be able to compete. 
unfortunately, uh, that, that is no longer available on the cloud. Uh, so we had to run around and see what else is available. So these things come and go a lot. Um, so they are available, but um, it, not necessarily permanently. Wait, so do yeah. we know what happened? Why it was taken down? Uh, no, I don't know why. So, so I, I, oh, I talked to them briefly and they just said that they're commercially interested in pursuing fault tolerant quantum computing. So I think just, yeah, they didn't think it was worth investing in maintaining it as a cloud service. Got it. Well, if anyone from Xanadu is listening, uh, give them access so we can test this out for real. So the next, are so we have Borealis maybe, but are there any specific advancements or developments in the hardware that would help enhance the implementation of the scheme? That, that's a good question because there are lots of parameters that you can tweak here. Um, so when we say uh, optimize or make better, I guess the question is on what front? Um, so so the, the, the biggest parameters, of course, are how many actual ports you have on the device, how many input uh, single photons you have or input squeezed vacuums, whatever the case may be. That's where most of the combinatorics comes from. But on top of that, you've got experimental considerations like efficiency. What's the, uh, the loss rate of a single photon traversing all the way through the circuit? Um, so if you consider like a single photon has a probability P of getting from one side to the other, if you've got N photons, it starts going as P to the power of N of measuring all of the photons. That's dropping exponentially. So um, there, there's an exponential trade-off that works against you in the undesired direction. So things like the loss rates in physical devices are really important. Uh, the repetition rate, as in how often, uh, at what rate, is it preparing single photons for independent samples? That's another important consideration. Uh, all of these things trade off against one another. Um, and then there's just the, the sheer monetary cost of, of running the whole operation, such as the cooling costs and things like that. Yeah, I'll just add too that, um, you know, uh, companies like SciQuantum that are pursuing single photon discrete variable quantum computing Basically, all the components there are the ones uh, that, you know, can integrate into boson sampling. So the single photon production, the waveguides, the detectors, and, um, well, you know, based on previous experiments from that group before they went uh, as a company, and also the revealed, you know, quotes from them uh, look, you know, quite promising in terms of development. And then, uh, Peter, you've been involved in experiments where it's just the, the, it, the quality of these components is really, really impressive. Oh, and like it, it's really rapidly improving. It's, you know, things like efficiency the, uh, of detectors and of waveguides. The, these are things that are just astronomically improving all the time, as you would expect, of course. Um, uh, so certainly things like sampling rates for a boson sampler, those are things that are going to increase a lot with improved technology. Got it. I feel like I want to ask you guys about a million more questions about the hardware, but I do want to get a little bit into what you guys think from the crypto side here as well before we wrap up. So with a lot of the chains that are moving to proof of stake, do you think, or what are the kind of the main key points, the benefit for moving to an efficient proof of work versus moving to proof of stake like Ethereum is doing? I mean, um, so proof of work does have security advantages over proof of stake. Um, the, the, really, the motivation for creating the proof of stake concept was to address this huge energy consumption that's invested into maintaining proof of work networks. However, it, it, it's not regarded as secure. And, and the reason is that the, the proof of work, considering the original Bitcoin protocol, for example, where you've got inverse hashing, the, the, the very unstructured nature of this hash function problem means that by definition, it's completely random who uh, succeeds in solving the problem. There's no really any way to game who the winner is going to be. And this randomization property is really important because it means that it, it, it undermines the ability for people to collude or conspire to, to do things that are fraudulent, undermine the security of the network. When it comes to proof of stake, which is a 
you know, you, you, you're participating by, 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 by placing some of your own crypto on the network. Uh, I mean, sure, it's still regarded secure, but it, it does have vulnerabilities in that it isn't as easy to ensure randomization and inhibit um, conspiratorial behavior as proof of work uh, enforces. So uh, I see it as a, a slightly different um, security consideration. Yeah, also proof of stake is uh, rather plutocratic in the sense that um, your ability to, uh, you know, control the dynamics of the, the blockchain depends upon how much stake you put in, which, you know, gives a huge advantage to people who are either first adopters or who just got a lot of tokens. Um, and then there are other attacks that are possible in proof of stake, like long range attacks and nothing at stake attacks where you can stake on various different blocks. Uh, so, um, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly not an, an expert in these things, but I, I certainly see that there is an ongoing debate about uh, the vulnerability of proof of stake relative to proof of work. And um, well, we, we've seen that Bitcoin has actually been around for quite a long time now uh, and has done, it's been quite robust. So I think people do have faith in the kind of proof of work mechanism. I do personally think that, you know, everyone getting a piece of the share is really powerful um, approach, which I haven't seen a ton of in the crypto world. And yeah, this does quote, kind of solve the equity problem, right? That we have with proof of stake or current proof of work mechanisms. So what's next for you two? What, how do you want to expand this work next? I think the, 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 the next obvious things to do are the, are the ones that we discussed, which is to what extent does this apply to other types of architectures, both other variations of boson sampling, as well as other architectures altogether that do different types of quantum sampling problems. To what extent does this generalize to NISC as a whole, as opposed just to boson sampling? Uh, and in addition to that, uh, working towards an actual testnet kind of implementation using physical devices, uh, which requires looking at what hardware is available today commercially, uh, understanding it, its behavior, and does it is it close enough to, to the theory uh, that it would be suitable for a testnet implementation. And if so, we'd like to build the testnet. Gavin, any thoughts? Yeah, I totally agree. I, I think it'd be very exciting. I mean, even just with the classical simulation, I think it would be very fun to, to get, you know, the testnet. That's what we're working on right now. Um, but uh, absolutely, getting our hands on some real boson samplers is the big, big goal. Great. So again, if anyone is listening that has a boson sampler sitting around in their garage unused, we would like to use it and start testing this out. So thank you so much, Peter Gavin, for coming on to the Quantum State today. For the listeners, you know, subscribe wherever you are. Make sure to listen. Send this to your friends. We're going to be doing a lot of cool episodes about quantum technology, crypto. Send in your questions to the folks at BTQ. Comment on our platforms and we will see you next time.